Good morning this morning. April morning, one of your bright, shiny faces. Somebody's ready to worship. Hallelujah. Oh, we're having trouble with the, uh, we're reloading the uh, pro presenter. All right. Let's, let's pray. Father, we just are ask you to come in the presence today. We uh, invite you into the middle of what we're doing. We begin, Lord, like we always do, just worshiping. And I pray you turn our hearts to you that we uh, can just begin to block out all the other things that compete for attention. And as we gather with the people of God, with the saints of God, that you will uh, be in the midst here, Lord God, and that you will get a hold of our hearts and we will connect with you and just worship you. We, we bless your holy name today. We thank you and bless you. Go. One, two, oh, I'm sorry. Do it again. Do it again. Excuse me. I got really, I got so into the spirit there, I forgot where I was at. Really.
God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, oh God, oh God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love So, so good with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Jesus, you are so good. Hallelujah. You have been good. All my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Bless us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord just told me to say that if you're missing out on a blessing from him, probably because you're not obeying him 
because a child who doesn't do what his father says doesn't get what his father has to offer. And I know there are things in people's hearts right now, because I've been there before, believe me, I've been there, that if you just let go of right now and get your heart right with the Lord and have peace in Him, He'll give you such a blessing you can't believe it. He wants good children that love Him and obey Him. And in return, He will bless you more than you have ever, ever understood. Give it a chance, folks. It works. I know. <laughs> we fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of mercy and love at the feet of Jesus.
presence of healing, a presence of repentance, a presence of abundance. Hallelujah. We trust you for all this, Lord. We're not just here for a feeling, Lord. Take this feeling that we feel and translate it into our spirits and into our hearts and change us for the better, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One last song. You getting tired yet? <laughs> I didn't think so. I thought I'd do it. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. All who've gone before us and all who Sing the 
song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions.
was, who is, and who is to come. And none can stand beside you. And we celebrate the one who is the resurrection and the life. Jesus, the name above all names. Conqueror and King. Almighty God. And our Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our Father. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We thank you, O oh God, for the life you give us. We thank you for the joy that you give us in knowing that our sins are forgiven. Hallelujah, that it's not about us earning anymore, that we just be in your presence. And we thank you. We give glory to you, the great and mighty, almighty God. There is no one like you. There is none like you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And we come in your presence, Lord, as a body today and pray, Father, that you would minister to us. Those that are here, those that are away, you see those that are in pain today, those that have suffered loss. We pray for Rose and her family today, Lord, and the loss of Ken this week, and just pray for the grace of God to be with them. We pray, Lord God, for those that are struggling with sickness and with illness. We pray for our brother Paul, who's home today, and he's been struggling. And we just pray for the touch of Almighty God on his body Hallelujah. to raise him up and strengthen him, Lord. And you see others as well, Lord God, that have, that have had issues this week and that are struggling with long-term things, Lord. And we just look to you because you are a good father. You said if we ask for an egg, you're not going to give us a stone. And we ask, Lord God, you, uh, you are a good God. And we bless your name. So we pray, Father God, that uh, you'll continue to be with us as we are in this place, that your presence would be here, that we would encourage one another, that we will bless your name. For holy is your name. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. Let your glory be here in this place today, we pray. In the name of our living God, and in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Why don't you take a couple of minutes and greet a few people around you this morning. Well, good morning this morning. Why don't you go ahead and find your ways back, if you can, to your seats. I'd like to see all that wonderful interaction. But we will continue with more interaction, more fellowship following the service. We've got a lot of wonderful food um, following the service, which you all need to come and stay until it's all eaten. So that is your, your requirement. Some churches make you stay and they take offerings till they get enough money. We make you stay until you eat all the food. So you decide what kind of church you want to go to. Anyway, 
We want to welcome you here today, especially if you're a first-time guest. We uh, trust you got a little Connect card on the way in, and we'd be delighted if you could fill that out and drop it in the offering just so we can know a little bit more about you. But we're so glad to have all of you here. Thank you. Uh, we welcome those of you that are joining us online this morning. And um, we will take an offering in a minute. If you have that Connect card, you can just drop it in the offering when we, we uh, take that in, the, in a moment. But um, it's, uh, God is good, and we welcome all of you here. We're glad that you're here. We're glad you took this time to be with us. It's not a big deal, uh, not a small deal. We uh, appreciate the fact that you've uh, carved this time out. But we believe it's a very important time to be together as the people of God. So I want to ask you to prepare your gifts and to prepare them lovingly. And uh, we, uh, um, we all need, in a small church like this, we all need to pull together. We need to, we, you have to decide if you're tipping or tithing. Tipping or tithing. If we're tipping, we're not going to make it. If we're tithing, the blessing of God is on everything. So let me just encourage you to give from the heart today, and I only say that I'm in the same boat with all of you, all right? I'm not going to tell you to do something that we're not going to do. So I just ask you to give generously today, give from your heart, and I want to ask the ushers to come forward as we prepare to give this morning. Oh, they got the toughest, meanest guys we got today, so you better give. They have orders. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For the way you've blessed us all abundantly, we thank you, Lord God, and uh, you're just such a good God, and so we give back to you, Lord God, out of our hearts. Bless these, these gifts and let them be used to make a difference in people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Does Pastor John tithe? Pastor John, do you tithe? Pastor John tithes too. I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Our men's and our women's group will both be meeting tonight at 6 p.m. The men meet over there in the, the comfy, comfy couches, and the women we meet over here outside the kitchen. Not in the kitchen. On the comfy, comfy. Outside the kitchen. On the comfy, comfy chairs. We get tables. So they don't get tables. We get tables. So come and join us tonight. We're going to continue with um, the Dutch Sheets book. Dutch Sheets book. Intercessory prayer. We're talking about... Um, Galatians 6.2, and bearing one another's burdens. So come and help us discuss that tonight. We will have prayer meetings this week, Tuesday at 10 a.m., meets in Pastor John's office in the back corner there, and the Thursday evening prayer meeting at 6.30 meets right here in the sanctuary. Speaking of prayer, we, the Fort Wayne is having another citywide prayer meeting at the Clyde Theater on Monday, May 6th. That starts at 6.30. It goes till 8.00. You don't have to get there at 6.30, but you do if you want a decent seat. And this is open to every believer in Jesus across Fort Wayne and the surrounding areas. And we meet at the Clyde Theater. And if you've not been there, I highly recommend you go. It is an amazing experience to go and pray with believers in Jesus across our city for our city. And whenever I've been there, we prayed for the different sectors in the city, the education and government and churches and family, the economy and so on. And it is not two and a half hours of sitting there trying to think of what to pray. It is very much directed, and there are worship teams from, from churches in Fort Wayne, and so there is singing, and there is prayer, and it's not at all boring, I will tell you that. And the last time I went there, um, Priscilla, were you and I sitting together? And we were sitting behind two Catholic nuns, and they turned around, and we all prayed together, and that was an amazing experience. I remember the one nun anointed my hands. That was, that was an amazing experience. So come and join us and pray with other believers. That is Monday, May 6th at the Clyde Theater. And April, Friday and Saturday, April 19th and 20th, it's a Friday night and a Saturday, we are hosting a poetry and songwriting retreat, and this we are hosting it. It is sponsored by... United or Adoration, which is an organization that was starting right here in Fort Wayne and is now international. And it is focusing on encouraging the arts in the church. And those of us who are talented in not this retreat focuses on poetry and songwriting, but United Adoration encourages all artists, whether you are dancers or musicians, um, painters, drawers, if you write um, any kind of performing or graphic arts 
um, United Adoration wants you to give you an opportunity to use those arts to worship the Lord. So that's what United Adoration is. The Ridge is hosting it. And we are encouraging you, if you are a poet or a songwriter, to come and join us. The, there is a link to sign up to register in the flock note. So come and join us if you are interested. Okay, Pastor John. Thank you. Thank you very much. I should mention uh, Eileen isn't here today. She's out visiting some of our many children and grandchildren. Uh, it's been kind of a blessing. She got to go to Chicago and see a couple grandkids and up to Wisconsin for a baby shower for uh, uh, grandbaby number 10, who is due next month. So, but she sends her love and her greetings and she's praying and probably watching. Uh, I don't know if she's able to do that or, or listening, not watching. She's on her way home, driving home right now. So, all righty. Well, I want to ask that uh, you pray with us as uh, we get into the word today. Father, we thank you and bless your name again. And we thank you again, Lord, for the precious words that come from the scriptures. And we pray that you will speak to us everything you have for our church. Help us to receive it. Let it make a difference in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Hogue this morning kind of gave my message already when he got that word from God. That's a, but you're going to, yeah, you'll hear that now. But um, let's take a look here. This young lady, whose name is Zoriah Terbeck, 28 years old. She lives in a little Dutch town close to the German border. She's going to die in about three weeks. She has no lingering illness or any physical pain in her body. But in early May, a doctor will come to her home by her invitation and administer a sedative to her heart that will be followed by a drug that will stop her heart. She invited this doctor to do the deed and even paid for it. Zoriah has a boyfriend she loves who's a 40-year-old IT programmer. She lives in a nice house with two cats. She's simply grown tired of living. She struggled with mental illness and depression, and her psychiatrist has assured her that she will never get better. So she feels like there's no hope for her. And this is about the saddest story I've read in a long, long time. You know, there are many followers of Jesus who struggle with depression and mental illness, but that doesn't mean there's no ultimate hope. Even in the midst of this kind of pain, Jesus' followers still know that they have a place here on this earth. I guess that's the part that's the hardest for me, is this young woman and so many, many others, they just have no sense of destiny or purpose or belonging. They feel like the world would not really miss them if they were gone. It wouldn't matter if they would just go away. How different things are when we belong to Jesus. When we belong to him, we know that in spite of how we feel, his love is real. His desire for us is real. And we can pray somehow that Zariah can find Jesus really soon and know this for herself. God has placed us all here in a family, the church, where we can meet, as people have said, meet Jesus with skin on. And we have a great opportunity to minister to one another just by being there for one another. But at the same time, the church has a commission to fulfill, a purpose that will give meaning to life for all those who are a part of it. Now we're studying the book of 1 Corinthians, and this is a book of the, it's a theology of the church. Now don't get hung up by the word theology, oh, oh. But it basically just tells us about the church. It's a guide to learning what the church is, what it does, and how it works. We're calling our study Living It Out because it is a very practical guide on how our lives as followers of Jesus and as a part of the church should be lived out in the midst of the culture we live in. Well, what is the church? Well, technically, we are in the Greek, the ekklesia. We've looked at that word before, which just simply means the gathering. We're the assembly of God's people together. But to understand what that really means could take pages and pages to explain.
The Apostle Paul, who wrote this book, instead of using a bunch of heavy-duty theological words, used instead a boatload of metaphors to give us a picture of the church. Now, we're going to begin chapter 3 this week, and if you have a Bible, you may want to open it there, and you can follow along. We'll see this morning that there are two huge roadblocks that we need to recognize that keep us from understanding who we are as a church and as followers of Jesus. Two obstacles that will cloud the vision that shows us that we are special to God and that our lives mean something so that we don't fall into despair like Miss Terbeek. Verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now Paul has quite a task on his hands because he needs to explain to this church who they are in Jesus and what the church is about. But they have wandered away from the most basic fundamental parts of what it means to be a Jesus follower. So he's going to have to do some remedial teaching. Don't you all love going to remedial classes? You go to remedial when you didn't learn it the first time. I think I read somewhere that 40% of college students, at least in community college, when they go to community college, they have to take remedial math, which means they've got to teach them what they didn't get in high school, and they have to pay for it, but they don't get any credits, but they can't, take, can't go on until they do that. That's what you do when you didn't learn it the first time. You've got to go back and pay the price and have remedial class, and that's what Paul has to do here. He's got to do remedial teaching. The church in Corinth, as we've seen, was started by Paul a few years before this letter we call 1 Corinthians was written. And he spent a year and a half there, 18 months. He passed the leadership role off to a man named Apollos, who was an extremely, exceptionally smart and capable teacher of the Word of God. Now the church, as we also had seen, had written Paul in the meantime asking for some advice about some things. But Paul also had been hearing about how far they had run off the rails in their behavior. And this letter is in response to both their questions and to address his concerns about them. Now in verse 1, he refers to them as brothers and sisters. This is already the fifth time he's used that phrase. Actually, it's just a word, and we all understand. He just said brothers, but in that culture, through cultures throughout history... Often they would say men or brothers, but it really meant everybody. So it was one word, but that phrase. He's used it five times. And here it's the first metaphor that we find in this chapter. Because in calling them siblings, he's picturing the church as a family. Other metaphors that he will use in this chapter are a field or a garden and a building or a temple. Later on in the birth, book of 1 Corinthians, he'll introduce the most popular metaphor of all, the church as a body. Now, all of these metaphors, family, garden, temple, body, have something in common. And that is that they consist of multiple parts, multiple components. And these parts are distinct from one another. They have different roles. They do different things. And each of those parts are necessary for the success of the whole. As we pick up the reading today, Paul has been lambasting them for choosing sides in the church. And in doing so, the individuals in the church were trying to exalt themselves somehow. When we're struggling to find our place, find our value, these are the kind of things you do. You choose up teams and say that your team is better than the other team. You're trying to generate some self-worth somehow. But these are followers of Jesus here. Paul will make the case that our worth is simply and powerfully based on the fact that we belong to Jesus. That's it. That's all we need. And it's a waste of time to try to prop ourselves up by human associations and human standards. Verse 2, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it yet. Indeed, you are still not ready. Paul had come several years before, like we said. He started this church from scratch. He walks into a, a pagan place. And this isn't even like America today where people got a little idea of the gospel. I mean, this is, this is frontier stuff. 
He started this church from nothing, and he got it up and running. And once it was established, he stayed on and taught them for a year and a half. And then he had to leave. He was hoping to come back to a church that had matured and grown. He was hoping to see some real progress when he got back. But no, he takes a look and he utters, you are still just a bunch of babies. Our modern cultural norms take some of the bite out of this insult where he talks about needing milk. Because when we talk about milk, well, kids drinking milk, yeah, kids drink milk for a long time. They drink, we drink it into adulthood. We drink it all the time. But not that long ago in human history, that didn't happen. The only milk a child received was when they were nursing. We're talking about a very small, a very young child, a very small baby. And Paul said, you've had a lot of time, but the needle measuring your spiritual growth has not moved at all since the time I was here. What's the difference between the milk and the meat of the word? Well, probably the clearest explanation is found in the book of Hebrews in chapter 5, the writer of Hebrews says, anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The Bible really never explicitly tells us what meat of the word means or what it is, what it would entail. There are some things considered elemental in the next few verses in Hebrews in chapter 6 that would allude to, to milk. Uh, where he says about repentance, faith in God, instruction about some rituals, laying out of hands, uh, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Basically, that's, that's baby stuff. Every believer should understand that. So the, the meat of the word is something beyond that. But it does tell us that the mature understand what righteousness means. And they've trained themselves in matters of good and evil. That simply means they've gone beyond knowing to doing. That's the mark of maturity. They've learned to walk their faith out in obedience. And not only were these Corinthians not able to digest the meat of the word, but they were also filling up on <laughs> spiritual junk food as well. The Corinthians were involved in a lot of behavior that runs counter to life in the spirit. They were sinning and enjoying every minute of it. They had abandoned the gospel for something that may look like solid food, but is altogether without nutritional value. Did you know you can't fill up on chocolate? I know that because I've tried. You have too. We can eat it until the sugar rush becomes too much. We can eat it until it's like, all right, I'm at capacity. But even when we cannot eat another bite, we still don't feel full because we're not. You certainly can fill up on meat. You can fill up on vegetables too. I think the church needs to learn that. We need to talk about food again sometime. These foods give your body what it needs, not necessarily what your eyes crave. But eating wisely brings about satisfaction in the body. And then even long-term health. And this illustrates the fundamental contrast between the true food of the gospel and the synthetic substitutes that the Corinthians had preferred. Paul was so disappointed with them because they had missed out so much on what God had intended to give them. There's hard evidence of this that Paul presented to them. Verse 3, you are still worldly. For since there's jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings? The fundamental test on how mature we are as believers has very little with what we say we believe or the way we can impress others. Remember, the Pharisees were very good at both of those. It could be seen in the way that we treat each other. It could be seen in the way that we interact with sin, whether we avoid it at all costs or if we enjoy stepping into it a little bit now and then, or all the time. The word worldly is used twice in this verse, and you can see it's also used in verse 1, but in the original words, there are actually two different words here between verse 1 and verse 3. 
In verse 1, the word literally means made of flesh. So this would describe an innocent baby. They're made out of flesh, right? That's what their bodies simply are. But the second word implies a special focus on base physical desires. It implies someone who indulges. And there's nothing good about that. You know, I just reflecting again, words. Doesn't it, does anybody else go crazy by the fact that the word adult is used for things that it shouldn't be? Adult entertainment? Adult bookshop? Oh, these must be mature people going in here. No, these are people that have completely lost control of their drives. Yeah. Gentlemen's club. You ever been to a gentleman's club? When I was Ubering, I did some stops at a gentleman's club. And I'll just say this. I pick somebody up there and take them home. After I get them out of the car, I want to take a bath and wash my car. You know, we've got these things. This, we got to understand what adult means. Now, as we saw last week, followers of Jesus are supposed to be filled with the Spirit. How in the world can anybody claim Jesus as Lord and have the Spirit of God living in them and be comfortable with any level of sin in their lives? I mean, we're going to trip and stumble, but to become comfortable with it. Like, it's okay. Worldliness, which is basically willful sin, is the first obstacle that has been keeping them from God's best. Now, in these verses, and actually in the whole book, Paul describes four kinds of people. First, you have the natural man, and that's the way we kind of come out of the box. That's the unsaved person. That's the person who does not have the Spirit of God living in them. Next, we have the worldly weak. And this simply refers to the new believer, so-called baby in Christ. They're weak, they haven't grown, they haven't matured. But then thirdly, we have the worldly willful. This is the older believer who's still immature. These are the ones Paul is speaking to now, which is apparently most or all of the church in Corinth. Lastly, are the spiritually mature. Now, basically, every person falls into one of those categories. But look at that, worldly willful. Why does it even exist? Paul does not question or challenge their faith, but he wonders aloud, how can you, those of you filled with the Holy Spirit inside you, live the way that you do? Divisions and quarreling, that we've already looked at, were not their only issues. As we will see, they also had sexual immorality going on in the church. They had lawsuits flying back and forth. They had marriage issues. They had other things. Now look at verse 4 and 5. When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Well, Paul's going into a transition here. He's going back to this idea of factionalism in the church, which has been kind of a theme from the beginning of the book. But this is just indicative of the way that they have abandoned what Paul had taught them from the Scriptures about loving one another. And it's just one more sin that they allowed that showed them that they were walking in contradiction of the Spirit of God. And so Paul says something to them that sounds kind of ironic. Are you not asking like, are you not acting like mere human beings? And they sit there and go, well, yeah, that's what we are, isn't it? <laughs> Aren't we human beings? Aren't we supposed to be that way? Well, the, there's two ways we can look at this. Uh, first, as followers of Jesus, we need to allow him to work in us so that we don't look like everybody else. We should have a presence that is notable. And make sure you hear me right. This doesn't come from putting on a happy face. We're playing a role. We're trying hard to impress others to make Jesus look good. I was in a uh, meeting one time with people who were in a, another faith system. They were in a religion. And they, had, they were talking about it with me. And they talked about something that they practiced where they said, fake it till you make it. So don't you agree with that? And I said, absolutely not. Let's pretend like we have peace. Let's pretend like we're godly. Let's pretend like, like God's doing all these things. You fake it until you make it. I don't want anything fake about me. It should come just out of our walking with Jesus 
every day that his essence should just roll off of us. The people know. You don't have to fake that. You don't have to pretend. You're not going to fake well enough to help Jesus on this one. Okay, trust me. People know that. People see that. You're not going to be able to fake your walk with Jesus to make it look like God is good if you really don't believe that and have not internalized it. People see right through that. But secondly, in these words, there's an implication in the way Paul said this. And of course, we always have these issues with the, with, when we're translating from one language to another. But there's an essence in the original here that they were living like slaves at the whim of their master. The way he uses the word man can, can refer to um, a slave. Sin had a hold of them. And this will happen even to a believer when they walk away from the grace of God and go looking in the world for something they think they need that God is not giving them. This is the block to understanding who they are as those belonging to God. Sin will misdirect them. Sin takes them into areas where God cannot and will not go. And you can't choose sin and then expect to feel satisfied, fulfilled, or complete in your life. It's not going to happen. A condition of sin in your heart will rob you of the peace of God. It will rob you of the blessing of God. It will rob you of the sense of belonging to God. It puts you on your own, and when you're on your own, that leads to really bad things. So our first challenge today is simply to evaluate our lives. Are there ongoing issues of sin that you willingly enter into on a regular basis? And that's the word we got earlier. It may not sound as serious as adultery, but maybe there is adultery, somebody listening here today. But there's other things that are associated with that. that how about pornography? I'm still concerned how many people, how many people are stuck deep in that. I've worked with people in pornography, and I'm telling you, you don't want to get into that mess because it is really, really sticky to get out of. It's hard. It captures and it holds a, an iron grip. Very powerful. You can't live in that camp and expect God's best for your life. And friends, pornography takes on a lot of forms these days. You know, a lot of movies and videos that go mainstream, and I even hear many, many Christians saying, you know, talking about them as though anybody would watch these. And they include naked bodies. Friends, if you've got a movie with naked bodies in it, that's pornography. Okay? Is there any deliberate lying or stealing in your life? And, you know, that can take on a lot of unusual forms. If we go to work, we decide we're going to waste time there and get paid to do nothing. That's stealing from our employer. Those of you that are business owners, you can say amen. Is there unforgiveness anywhere? No matter how badly you've been wronged, Jesus has forgiven everything you did to him, every sin in your life. And some people may say, well, if you understood how bad it was, God will look at my situation and say, it's okay. But as I, uh, they, they may say, well, I, I think God will understand if I hold this grudge forever and if, and if, I, don't, um, if I don't forgive. But as I read the Gospels, I'm not so sure he will understand. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he won't. These are just a few examples of sins and how we need to truly evaluate if we're hosting them on site in our lives. As followers of Jesus, we will miss out on the life he has for us when we do that. That's what was happening in Corinth. The more we choose things that are not the things God wants for us, the more we have to work at finding our own way, our own peace, our own, familiar, our own fulfillment. And friends, those ways always will fail us. Well, let's look at the second obstacle Paul brings here that keeps us from God's best for us. Verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will be rewarded, each be rewarded according to their own labor. When you come into a church as a new pastor, there's one thing that you can be sure of, and that's that are some people that are going to compare you with the former pastor. And people will say things to one another, and sometimes to you, or sometimes just so you can hear on the edge. It's just not the same since Pastor Gary was here. The ridge just isn't the ridge anymore. Right? Actually, 
to the credit of this congregation, I did not hear that very much at all, even though there was some. But that's what Paul had to contend with, because Paulus, Apollos came in. Paul, as you can see, they said he wasn't much to look at. He wasn't very impressive. Uh, he just preached no bells and whistles. And then Apollos came in, who was a very polished person, very, very good with the word, um, a, a very educated person. And uh, it seems, as we read through uh, Corinthians, that Apollos was far more popular. And that turned a lot of the Corinthian believers against Paul. Now, Apollos himself would have had none of this. But people are what they are. And Paul planted, he literally planted the church. He started it from nothing. Apollos came next, and he watered it. That is, after this church had found root, and after Paul moved on, Apollos was there to give the church what it needed in order to grow. So how did it grow? Was it the magnificent teaching of Apollos? Was it because Paul had done that? No, God makes it grow. They put the thing in motion. They set the conditions, but God is the one who brings the growth. He's the only source of growth. Everybody else is simply playing a role, including the leaders. And the problem you run into when you're in leadership is that they tend to paint you, you're the people that are following you, tend, tend, tend to paint you way too big or way too small. And uh, let me, uh, that most people just can't find that place in the middle. Let me kind of give you an example. This reminds me of Paul himself. He and Barnabas went into the town of Lystra. We read about this in Acts 14. And when they were there, they encountered a man who was lame. And they prayed for him. Right? Actually, they just said, stand up on your feet. And the guy stood up and he was healed. And the whole town went bonkers. They went crazy. They'd never seen anything like that. He just spoke to the guy and he was healed. And they said, the gods have come down to us in human form. And this is what it says. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Here they come into the town. They do this miracle, and people are like, oh, oh, what's happened? The gods have come down. And then the next verse, after all this, it says some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. Well, that escalated quickly. In the course of one day, he went from being on par with Zeus to getting stoned. That's what leadership does to you. Ask me how I know. We need, we tend to make way too much or too little of others, especially in leadership. Paul is making the point that we are all of equal value in the kingdom. All of us. All the leaders, all the people. God does his work through his church, and that church is made up of a lot of different kinds of people. And we're all on the same pay scale in the kingdom. But we all have different functions. Verse 9. For we are co-laborers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. The second obstacle is when we forget this. We make ratings for our leaders and others. Look at these metaphors, God's field, God's building. As we looked at earlier, each of these metaphors requires many kinds of pieces, and the wise and the mature understand this. Our second blockage, our second obstacle that Paul brings to mind here is assigning to others what belongs to God. That is, we put our trust in certain people to make things happen. We make too much of them, and often that gives us a, gives us a good excuse to do little or nothing ourselves. Well, leaders are going to take care of this. Pastor's going to take care of this. Everybody's going to, and I'm going to sit in the back and cheer for him. Rah, rah. And then I don't have to do anything. We love making excuses, don't we? I was thinking about a time once when I didn't do something I was supposed to do, and I know I should have done it. And Eileen came, and she, was, she said, there is no excuse that you didn't get this done. I said, oh, I've got an excuse. She said, what is it? I said, I didn't want to. She said, that is a terrible excuse. You said you, didn't, you, said you had an excuse. I said, I didn't say it was a good one. I knew it was a terrible excuse, but it was an excuse, all right? Absolute. That's a pretty big word there. 
But anyway, in any case, we have the privilege of being in God's service, of working with him and being on his team. Why would we want to make an excuse to not do that? There's a picture that the Bible doesn't use for a metaphor, and the reason is a good reason. It's because this uh, metaphor didn't exist yet. That is the jigsaw puzzle. We all have a shape to our personality, to our style. Some of us have very unusual or unique looks. Some people can do amazing things. They have extraordinary gifts. They're like one of those unusual pieces. Others have really vivid colors. If you've done puzzles, you know that some of the colors, you know, those are the easiest ones to find because they have the action going on or the middle of the, the, the main event. But there's lots and lots of pieces that just have kind of the, the, the sky pieces and like this one here, the leaves on the side. And they're just, they're not as, uh, they're not as vivid. They're not as uh, noticeable. Some people have lots of color. They have that personality, that charisma. But many of us are just plain and simple. And perhaps we're a basic shape or perhaps one of the bland colors of the sky or the water. But when it comes to God's jigsaw puzzle, just like ours, the finished picture requires all of the pieces. And when they all come together, it's a beautiful picture. But they all have to be there. There's nothing more frustrating. Eileen and I have done a lot of puzzles, and this happened once or twice. That there's nothing more frustrating than putting a puzzle together with hundreds of pieces, and you get to the end and find you are short one piece. Ah. This is what happens in God's kingdom when we feel like we're not needed or our abilities and gifts are not necessary. Our availability doesn't matter. We can just hide on the side. Simply because we see others with more noticeable or popular appeal. The book of 1 Corinthians, as we saw, is a theology of the church. And Paul is showing us that each piece of the church is needed. Every one of us. But not everyone is connecting. Not everyone is receiving even some of the basics that God wants to give them. If we take care of these issues that was our word this morning. God's going to give us things that we're not getting right now that we need and that we want. And I think one of those strongest things, and this is the thing that's so missing in our culture, in spite of all of our high tech and every pleasure at our, uh, possible at our right hand, it's the sense of belonging, the sense of peace, the sense of meaning. Everybody else is missing that. Of course, our young lady at the start of this, what a horrible story. But this is something that's available to us as a people of God. We just need to remove the obstacles that we put in front of us. Paul showed two reasons that some are missing out on what God has for them. But these reasons need to be understood and they need to be fixed. God has created us in love and with purpose. And that purpose is firmly embedded within the church. Let us throw off every sin that may be hindering. And let us throw off every judgment, both high and low, about leadership and about others in the church. And let us freely accept our commission, whatever it may be, to live and thrive in the church community. And now God's going to give us all of this. Is this making sense? Pray with me. Father, I pray that you will just help us as your people to realize how important we are to you, how valuable we are to you. I pray, Lord, for those that may be struggling today with just that sense of identity, that sense of peace that's been somehow shattered or violated, a sense of not belonging, a sense of not fitting in, a sense of somehow not really uh, feeling that, um, the, the sense of destiny. And Lord, you have all that for us. You have a place. You have peace for us. You have meaning. You have destiny for each of us. So I pray that you will help us, Lord God, in this time. Help us to receive from you what you have for us. Father, there's a lot of things that can, can, can block this, but we see two of them here in what Paul showed us today. So I pray, first of all, Lord, for your people. If there's issues of willful sin in, area, in any area of their lives, things that they are just kind of pushing under the rug and trying not to think about, that we realize what a big deal sin is. 
You don't hate us. You don't push us away. But we do miss out on a lot of blessing when we walk in willful sin. So I pray, Lord, you give us repentant hearts today that you will forgive us for those sins. Forgive us for going after things that we know were wrong. Forgive us for dabbling in things for just a little bit. Forgive us, oh God. Take our sin away. Maybe there's those with big sins, Lord God. Forgive them as well. And I pray you help us to just put these things before you. And I pray that you also help us to just keep one another in proper perspective. That we are brothers and sisters together. We are a family. We are joint together. We don't need to elevate anybody. We don't need to push anybody down. All of us have struggles, difficulties, fears. All of us have things that we do that make us hard to live with, make us irritating. But Lord, you've given us something the world doesn't have. You've given us grace. So I pray that you give us grace in our hearts for anybody that we need to forgive because we've just put the wrong expectation on them. Maybe exalting them too high, maybe putting them down too low. But let us just see that we are together, a band, a band of brothers and sisters walking together in your kingdom. In spite of all of our faults and the things that make us hard to live with, let us work together to build your kingdom together, to find a lot of joy in the process, being with one another. Father, all of us know that we can be in a family with imperfect people and still love one another and enjoy being together, even in spite of our flaws, even in spite of those irritating things that never go away. Let us have that attitude in the church to just love one another, that nothing would hinder our prayers, nothing would hinder our service to you. Help us to receive this today, Lord. Minister to us, I pray. And I want to ask just for a moment, if you keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed for a minute, all these promises are for people that belong to Jesus. If you have not been born again, as the Bible says, this isn't for you, but you can be born again right in this moment if you haven't. And we like to do this in virtually every service. I want to ask if there's anybody here that needs Jesus. And what that means is this. We need to, re we need to know that we must be saved from our sins and we cannot save ourselves. And the Bible tells us Jesus died on the cross in our place. And that the way to heaven is not through trying hard and doing good things and going to church and doing any kind of certain kind of sacrifice in our lives to try to make God love us. God loves you just the way you are. But we need to, rem we need to admit that we have sinned, but then we need to ask for God's forgiveness for that and to believe that because Jesus died in our place on the cross, he will take our sin upon him. But that means we have to admit we cannot save ourselves. We have to believe. And we also read that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day to give us eternal life. And that's good news. So then we will make him our Lord of our lives too to follow after him. So for anybody today to say, Pastor John, I want to pray that prayer. I want my sins forgiven. I want to be born again. I've never done that. Just raise your hand and say, pray for me. And I'll pray for you in this moment if there's anybody today. And thank you so much. Father, we thank you for the salvation that comes free even though it came at great cost to you. And let us all walk with a lot of joy that, we're know, that we know that we can walk with you and that heaven is on, on, the, on the radar for us for the future. I pray you help us to just love one another, help us to avoid sin. Let us walk in all the fullness you have the, to understand that we have a place, that we have peace, that we have a Savior that loves us. We have a God in heaven that watches over us. We have a Heavenly Father who's crazy about us. Let us receive that and hold on to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we end today, I think it would be really wonderful. We're going we're gonna to share communion. And based on what we just talked about, being a part of the body, this is a body activity as we come together to share the Lord's table. And um, we celebrate what he did for us. And in Jesus, not only dying, but the suffering. And then the death. He created, we are part of his body. Um, through his broken body. And that draws us together and makes all these promises we've talked about come alive. So we want to do that this morning. We want to uh, share. So I'll just ask if um, uh, we'll start on this side again to come up. And uh, if you guys can go around this way after you take the elements and hold them until everybody's been served, then we'll do the middle and then the last section.
Let's pray together. Lord, today we thank you for the broken body of Jesus. And as, as we stand here and remember, we looked at today the benefits you want to pour out. Lord, we see that you're pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment of the bloodless peace is upon Jesus, and by his stripes we are healed. So, Lord, bring healing into hearts, minds, bodies, souls, spirits, whatever healing we need to do. That is part of our healing. That is part of what you died for. That's part of the benefit of belonging to you. And we're so thankful for the willingness of Jesus to open that door for us, for his willingness to suffer in his body. We take this bread, and we thank you for it. And we remember that we are a part of your body now in this world. So I pray that even as we celebrate this, that you empower us to go out and be your hands and feet, to be your voice, to be your heart for the people in our world this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat the bread. Thank you for the cup which represents the blood of Jesus, the blood of the new covenant in his body, which came to take away all of our sin. He's the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the earth, who takes away the sin of the world. We thank you for our redemption. We thank you, Lord God, that it's no more about us trying to please you, no longer trying to make our own way, no longer a time of earning our salvation. But this blood that the cup represents has washed it all away. And all we have left to do is to believe, and you believe. And that's why we do this together, Lord. We believe and we thank you for the blood of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, what that means for us as we as a church collectively celebrate and thank you and remember the sacrifice Jesus poured out for us. In Jesus' name, let's drink the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Well, God is good. It's been wonderful to have to be in his presence today. Thank you all for coming today. And uh, please. Please stay afterwards. Let's have some more fellowship together as we go from here. God bless you all. Thanks for being here.